I'll say that we can get started right now. Um, as a quick intro, the topic for this month was physical activity. So Kristen will be um, just going over how nutrition pertains to physical activity and exercise. Perfect. Thanks, Alicia. So I'm Kristen. Um, I am going to be talking about nutrition for exercise and sport, as Alicia said. So before we dive in, just a quick intro to me. If you have never met me or heard about me before, I'm Kristen and I am the registered dietitian for Southern New Hampshire University. I work for Sodexo, um, but I support the university community in the full capacity. So I work with students on campus. I work with staff um, in the mill or those who are virtual who live in New Hampshire or Massachusetts um, and support the dining facility, lots of different things. So a little bit of background on why you should listen to me, why you should trust me when talking about this topic. So I um, got my bachelor's degree from nutrition at UNH um, back in 2015. I also completed my dietetic internship, which is 1,200 1, hours of supervised practice in the field. Um, that was in 2016. I also um, then became a registered dietitian nutritionist, and that has the mandatory continuing education every year. And then over the last four years, I have worked at SNU as the campus dietitian um, and have worked really closely with the athletics department, um, helping the athletes fuel and learn about sports nutrition and have since got um, my board certified specialist in sports dietetic certification. Um, and along with that, I am also just very, very passionate about being physically active. So I personally have always been an athlete. I grew up playing sports. Um, I did work as a certified personal trainer for a couple of years out of college, but decided I wanted to keep that as more of a hobby and wanted to keep just fitness as something personal for myself. And then over the past year, um, I have dove headfirst into endurance sports. Um, over the past year, I've completed an Olympic duathlon. I've done two sprint triathlons. And then I'm actually completing my first half marathon this weekend. So everything I am telling you, I personally do myself. And I really specialize in and take a lot of time researching the best practices to empower athletes and physically active um, people how to fuel their bodies well while also maintaining a healthy relationship with food in their bodies. That's kind of my overall mission as a dietitian. So today we are gonna talk all about sports nutrition basics. And with this topic, I am really focusing on the either athlete or active individual who's pretty active and who considers themselves um, really looking to meet specific athletic goals if it is to run a marathon or compete in a triathlon or meet certain strength training goals, um, really specific stuff that really needs solid nutrition and to really optimize performance. I am more than happy to um, talk about general nutrition to optimize just general healthy living. If you're somebody who maybe does yoga or walks and does more gentle movement, this nutrition advice might not be as pertinent. Um, however, it's still super interesting and I hope you guys get something out of this. So we'll go over the basics of general sports nutrition. And then we're also gonna talk a little bit on supplements and holistic considerations for um, athletes. So when it comes to nutrition, a lot of the times people think that, oh, nutrition is just carbs and it's protein and it's fat and it's just what you are, like vitamins and minerals and that's it. But recognizing that the foods that we eat can influence so much in our body. So it not only gives the body its energy sources and repairing the body and strengthening it, it's also gonna maximize health and performance. It's a huge critical piece to mental health um, and well-being. And there's just so many different wheels that all work in place, which is why I have this picture. When it comes to nutrition, I really focus on merging the principles of intuitive eating and learning how to fuel yourself well and take care of your body paired with sports nutrition and using those specific principles that are evidence-based and merging those two things together and finding a really good balance. And with this, it's really important to recognize that if you are looking to do intense physical activity and you're looking to bring your, per to per your performance to another level, you need to make sure you're fueling adequately to do so. And that means making sure you're just eating enough to fuel your own human body. And that takes a lot to begin with. And we'll talk more about what that kind of means, but we really need to make sure that you're having enough to make sure your heart is working well, make sure your reproductive organs are working well, make sure your mood is stable. And then it's that additional kind of energy that you have to take in to support performance and make sure your performance is 
optimal and your food is getting you where you need to be. So you can't be a successful athlete without fueling the human first. So when it comes to fueling, the really basic first thing we have to talk about is meeting your energy needs. An adequate energy intake is the key to optimal performance. And typically under fueling is what I see as the number one kind of issue with any athlete or active individual who's looking to optimize their performance. Typically, I see that they're just not eating enough food. And when it comes to eating enough and getting enough calories in, it's important to recognize that calories are our body's energy source. And energy for us is our fuel. That's what we are using to work. It's what our muscles are using to function, especially during physical activity. We need enough calories to support that. So how do you figure out how many calories you need? Now, I am not a huge numbers person. I am never going to be the one to make you count calories calories or count macros, I think maybe it's a helpful for a very short period of time to learn if you're someone who really doesn't know about what foods have carbohydrates and how many and what does that look like? I think it can be helpful very short term, but it's 100% not necessary. And that's something that I help people kind of understand to fuel their body internally without having to worry about all of the external numbers and whatnot. But for those who are interested and are wondering, well, how could we estimate how much calories we need? So you're going to see this nice equation with all the letters here. Um, basically, what this says is that your total daily energy expenditure, that is formulated with your resting metabolic rate. And your resting metabolic rate is basically the amount of calories you burn at rest. If you were to lie in a coma all day, how many calories do you burn? So that plus your thermic effect of food, so calories you burn from actually the food you're eating and your body digesting, plus your physical, acti your physical activity energy expenditure. And this is comprised of both your non-exercise activity, so fidgeting and kind of just walking around from day to day and just the movement you do that's not like prescribed exercise. And then we have our exercise and energy expenditure. So in order to do this, um, you have to first figure out your resting metabolic rate. And that can be done either using like metabolic testing, which isn't super accessible to a lot of us or predictive equations. And then from there, um, we normally at we normally multiply some sort of physical activity level anywhere from 1.2 to a sedentary person, all the way up to like 2.5. So double your resting metabolic rate if you are really, really active. So calorie intake you're going to see is going to be much higher calorie demands are going to be much higher for people who are very physically active because they're just burning that many more calories during exercise. And eating enough calories is really important to sustain energy during exercise, to build and maintain muscle mass, to recover from training, and then to maintain, of course, the normal human body functions, just keeping your body healthy as a human. And inadequate energy intake can and eventually will compromise performance. So what, how does that happen? So with this topic comes energy availability. And this basically is looking at, is your energy intake meeting your energy expenditure? So do you have enough energy coming in, enough fuel on board to fuel your training, to fuel your recovery, to fuel muscle building, to fuel bone health, menstrual cycles, your work and personal life? Do you have energy just to stay functioning at your job and all the activities of daily living? under fueling happens when we have low energy availability. So when you're just not eating enough to support that balance of training, recovery, your muscles, all of that, you have high energy demands and your fuel intake is just not enough. And why does this happen? So increase in training without increasing in fuel. And this can happen just because maybe unaware. So you might just not know that you need to eat more and it's just lack of education of how to fuel properly. And it can also be a decrease in intake, and that could be from calorie counting, trying to track um, macros. It could be trying to eat really healthy and choosing mostly vegetables when you really need a dense source of carbohydrates as an athlete. It could be just having a really busy schedule and not having time. Um, and it could be more a focus on disordered eating or an eating disorder of underfueling and having that negative relationship with food come in um, to affect your performance. So what happens if you are under fueling? How can that influence performance? So we have something that is called relative energy deficiency in sports. And this essentially is all about low energy availability. So there's not enough energy coming in to support the energy expenditure. And there are health and performance consequences. Um, metabolism will slow down. There can be loss of a menstrual cycle, fatigue, stress fractures, weakened immune system, GI discomfort, loss of focus. You'll see 
on the right of this photo, all the different things that are going to be affected when their body does not have enough calories coming in. So REDS, Relative Energy Deficiency in Sports, was expanded on the female athlete triad. And this is something that um, really focus only on females and disordered eating and kind of the consequences that was seen kind of back in the literature. And what the female athlete triad focuses on is that low energy availability, which typically would stem from disordered eating, which led to loss of a menstrual cycle because the body was not getting enough energy to support reproduction. And with loss of a menstrual cycle, typically that is um, foundationally from low estrogen levels. And estrogen is a critical component for absorbing calcium into the bone. And what would typically be seen is that there would be disordered eating, there would be loss of a menstrual cycle, and then there'd be stress fractures or breaking bones. Um, and that would be the triad. However, this expansion on the triad is really to encompass and show that much more is influenced in our health way beyond just menstrual cycle and bone health when we're not eating enough and there's um, low energy availability. So again, the immune system, gastrointestinal issues, heart issues, mental health, growth and development, endocrine, lots of things. And this also highlights the performance consequences as well. So decreased endurance, increased injury risk, decreased, decreased training response, judgment, um, decreased coordination and concentration, depression, not enough energy stores, lots of things can be influenced if there's not enough food coming in. So really important to recognize that under fueling, is not the route to take as an athlete if you are looking to optimize your performance. So what do you do? So the way that I focus on nutrition is really looking at your plate and building a strong plate. And I want to say that this plate right here is not adequate at all. This would not, this could be a snack, for example, but this would not be anything close to what an athlete would need or an active individual would need for a meal. So meeting energy needs with training plates. This is what I use a lot with my athletes on campus um, and with people who really just aren't looking to be super numbers driven and can focus more on a holistic approach. So when it comes to creating healthy meals and a balanced meal, um, if you've worked with me, if you've seen a presentation, it all comes back to creating a well-balanced meal. And this also comes into place with athletes. So you'll see based on the amount of physical activity and the amount of training, carbohydrates are gonna be manipulated. So if you are not super active, you're more of a walker, um, gentle yoga, maybe um, you're going to focus more on a low training or somebody maybe who's injured and not able to get a lot of physical activity. That would be a low um, training plate. And that's going to be around half the plate coming from fruits and vegetables, a quarter coming from carbs, a quarter coming from protein and then healthy fats thrown in there. Medium training plate would be an athlete maybe who has regular practice, one to two hours, um, maybe, yeah, like one to two hours, maybe more like one hour of moderate training would be around a third of the plate coming from carbohydrates, a third from protein, and then a third from fruits and veggies with healthy fats. And then hard training plates are going to be for those game day nutritions, for events, for double training sessions, really hard, intense activity that's gonna be half of the meal coming from carbohydrates, a quarter from protein, and a quarter from fruits and veggies. So let's break these down more and talk about what carbs and proteins, fats, and why they're important for performance. So complex carbohydrates are gonna be half of the plate. So we're looking at a somebody who's in the middle of training for a marathon or a triathlon or super active, exercising a good amount, and needs to make sure that they are focusing on carbohydrates. So why do we need carbs? Why are those important? So carbohydrates are the body's main source of energy for high intensity and endurance exercise. They are our primary fuel for brain and muscle. We use carbs for um, energy during these activities. And we also do use fat, which we'll talk about, but we use carbohydrates in a higher demand during the high intensity and during endurance high performance activity. We store carbohydrates in our body in both our muscle and our liver, and this is called glycogen. So we can store around 1,500 to 2,000 calories of carbon in the body. And this equates typically to around 90 to 120 minutes of vigorous exercise. So we have that amount of calories stored. And then once we kind of go through those that fuel tank, we have to make sure we're fueling the body with more carbohydrates to make sure that our muscles stay working. We don't bonk. We don't hit the wall. We're having adequate energy going to the brain. We're able to absorb water well with carbohydrates. All very important. So we're also able to use carbohydrates during activity to make sure our glycogen levels 
don't get depleted. We make sure we fuel before the levels get depleted and can help make sure that our muscles stay well um, adequately fueled. There are two types of carbohydrates. We have complex carbs and we have simple carbs. Complex carbohydrates are going to be what society tells us are those really healthy ones, our whole grains, things that we want to prioritize a majority of the time. So these are going to be things that have a lot of fiber in them and things that we want to prioritize more at meal times. So things like whole wheat breads, bagels, muffins, um, whole wheat wraps, all that kind of stuff, our starchy vegetables like potatoes, sweet potatoes, winter squash, other whole grains like um, brown rice, like quinoa, farro, pasta, um, whole grain cereals, all of that kind of stuff is really going to be outside of exercise time. So these are things that take a little bit of time to digest. They have fiber in them, which can sometimes create some bloating a little bit. And these aren't things that we want to have right before exercise, again, because they are higher in fiber and they take more time to digest. So simple carbohydrates are really things that athletes want to prioritize around the exercise window. And we'll talk more about kind of fuel timing and whatnot. But simple carbs are, are carbohydrates that don't have a lot of fiber with them. So we can digest them well, they move through the stomach quickly, and they get right to the bloodstream and get right into our muscles to be taken up as fuel. So these are things we want to have right before, during, or after exercise. Things like white breads, white pasta, things like pretzels, um, animal crackers, fruit snacks, skaterades, gels, chews, that kind of stuff, fruit. Um, fruit. There's some fruits that go well, some fruits are more fibrous and might cause GI upset. So I normally stick with things like bananas that are really easy, um, more water-based fruits like watermelon or oranges that typically don't cause GI upset. Some people are sensitive with things like apples um, that have more fructose in them that could make them a little gassy. So typically kind of, that's where nutrition becomes more individualized and figuring out what works well. So carbohydrate recommendations, again, for those who like the numbers and who want to know, typically 45 to 65% of your daily energy intake should come from carbohydrates. Athletes will tend towards that higher side and sometimes even higher depending on where they're at in their training. So moderate exercise, we're looking at around um, five to seven grams of carbohydrate per kilogram a day. For endurance exercise, one to three hours a day is six to 10. And then extreme endurance or carbo loading, we're looking more at that 10 to 12 grams of carbohydrates a day. And this is a lot of carbohydrates, especially in our culture that is obsessed with low carb and we think carbs are bad, carbs are the devil. Most athletes and most active individuals could be eating more carbohydrates. Um, for that one hour a day, if we're looking at a 150 pound athlete, if we're looking at that five to seven range, that is 340 to 480 grams of carbohydrates. Um, for that endurance training, 410 to 680 grams a day. And then if you're carb loading, for example, we're looking more at like 680 or to 820 grams of carbohydrate a day, which is equivalent to around 11 bagels. So that's a lot of carbohydrates. And that might be something that I normally will have to help an athlete work into if they're not used to taking in that amount of carbohydrates. I'm normally working to figure out what feels comfortable and then kind of gradually building up to see how performance is optimized and influenced um, based on the amount of carbohydrates you're taking in. So next we have protein and we're going back to our plate. So around a quarter of the plate should be coming from protein. So it's around the size of like one to two palms. Protein rich foods are going to be those um, animal foods. We have um, dairy products, beans and lentils, protein powders are all going to be quality sources of protein. So protein fuels performance um, by being a building block. So protein breaks down into amino acids and amino acids are what help build and repair different tissues in our body. Most think about protein, um, but, or sorry, mostly we think about muscles um, and helping rebuild muscle that is broken down during exercise, but it's also critical for supporting um, bones, tendons, ligaments. Um, we need it for hormone development, neurotransmitter development. Very, very important. Leucine is a specific um, amino acid that is key for muscle protein synthesis. So this is an amino acid that we need really to help rebuild muscle and help keep the muscles strong. So athletes and active individuals really should be focusing on getting quality sources of leucine, typically around one to three grams um, at all your meals, especially after post-workout snacks. Milk and dairy products have been seen to be one of the best sources of leucine um, and really high quality. Other sources are gonna be animal-rich foods. So chicken, beef, turkey, eggs, pork, fish are gonna be, 
all going to be very good sources of leucine, as well as um, whey-based protein powders, pea protein, those also provide leucine. And then there also is some energy production. So protein can contribute up to 10% of, daily, of total energy used during exercise. And something to keep in mind is that if our carbohydrate intake is not high enough and we don't have enough glucose to support the body, our body will convert amino acids into energy because that is the preferred thing of the body. It needs a good source of energy. So carbohydrates are critical to sparing protein. So protein can do its real job. So if you're not eating enough carbs, you're really not getting the maximal benefits of protein. So that's something really important to keep in mind. The key to protein is to be consistent. So what we typically see in the standard American diet is that there's a little bit of protein at breakfast, maybe a moderate amount at lunch, and then this huge amount and portion at dinner. And what is seen to be most successful for muscle protein synthesis is to have protein intake be consistent throughout the day. So we're getting good recovery all throughout the day. We're getting consistent spurts of protein. So that's typically recommended to be around anywhere from 15 to 30 grams of protein at every meal and at most snacks throughout the day. So these are all examples of what um, 20 grams of protein could look like. And I want to point out that nuts and peanut butter will provide some protein, but you have to eat a lot of those foods, a lot of those nuts and seeds to get enough protein. So whereas you might only need three ounces of um, chicken to get in your protein, you might need up to a cup of peanut butter to get that amount of protein. And that's a lot of excuse me, calories, and you're going to feel really full. So thinking about whole sources of protein that are going to be a little bit more packed can be more helpful to meeting those goals. So protein recommendations are going to be around 10 to 35 percent of daily energy intake. Um, you'll typically hear the daily recommended protein um, for the average American human or average human should be 0.8 grams per kilogram. And this is just simply not enough. Not enough for anybody, in my opinion. I typically like to recommend a little bit of higher protein. That typic, that 8.8% or 0.8 grams per kilogram is really to like help support all the muscle breakdown that happens just on a daily basis and isn't really optimizing the muscle that you could be building. So for endurance athletes, I recommend 1.2 to 1.8. Typically, actually closer more to the 1.6 and up is what I like to recommend for all athletes. But this gives a range depending on what the goals are. 1.2 might be appropriate for um, someone who is carb loading and needs to really focus more on the carbohydrate intake of the diet and less on um, less on protein at that time. Um, intermittent high intensity could be 1.4 to 1.2 grams per kilogram. And then um, strength and power looking more at 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram. So that could be as much as one gram per, per pound of body weight. So for our 150 pound endurance athlete, their protein needs are gonna be around 100 grams per day. And that's around 400 calories. And then per meal, it's recommended that we break protein intake up into 0 0.25 to 0 0.3 grams per kilogram for, for your meal and post-workout snack. And that would look again to be around 17 to 20 grams of protein. And finally, we have, or not finally, because we're going to talk about fruits and veggies too, but our last macronutrient is fats. So fat sources, um, we'll cover these and how they break down in a moment, but how do fats fuel performance? So fats are a source of dense energy. So compared to carbs and proteins, fats have more energy per bite. Carbs and fats are our two main fuel sources in the body and what we're going to be using um, during Exercise besides high, high, high intensity exercise, when we are doing anabolic or anaerobic exercise, our body can only use carbohydrates. But when we're doing aerobic and we're doing more low to moderate intensity exercise, we are able to use fats as fuel and um, have those be broken down. And the reason why we can start using those as fuel is because the less intensity that's going on, our body can work through better and utilize fats more it takes longer for our body to process fat and to get it through different energy systems to create ATP. Whereas we're gonna create a lot of ATP from fat, which is basically like an energy molecule for our body. It's just gonna take a longer period of time. Whereas carbs, we're not able to create quite as much, but it goes through a lot faster. So for high intensity, shorter exercise, we need carbohydrates, that's the preferred source. But as we start to get longer, like I said, we can start using fat for fuel. Fats are also critical um, for absorbing vitamins, um, vitamins A, D, E, and K. 
And these are critical for supporting performance, bone health, and recovery. And then certain fats, especially omega-3 fatty acids, are also very anti-inflammatory and have um, very critical components of the brain structure. So what are the types of fats? So we have trans fats, saturated fat, and unsaturated fat. Trans fats are gonna be the ones that we're gonna wanna limit a majority of the time. So I'm a big believer in all foods and all, um, everything in moderation, all foods fit. There's a time and place for everything. But recognizing trans fats really aren't going to be optimizing performance in any way. They're gonna taste good and we can have them um, and recognize when a good time to have them is around exercise. Typically, I wouldn't recommend having a big fried meal before going out for a long run. Um, but there's always a time and the place for certain foods. Saturated fats are things that we want to have in moderation, again, linked to heart disease in higher quantities. However, saturated fat is critical for creating cholesterol. Um, so making sure, and cholesterol is important for creating hormones. So having whole milk dairy products, red meat, egg yolks, all of these things that are also very packed with nutrients. Um, red meat is rich in iron, B vitamins, um, eggs are rich in choline, which is critical for the brain. Dairy is really rich in iodine, which is important for our thyroid. So lots of different things are, lots of these foods are very nutrient dense. So we still want to be incorporating them. And then our unsaturated fats are the ones we want to prioritize. These are known to be more of our heart healthy fats. Um, so things like nuts and seeds, avocado, olive oil, salmon, um, lots of, most of those plant-based sources of fats, and then along with our fatty, oily fish are things that we want to incorporate. So recommendations for athletes, 20 to 35% of daily energy intake should come from fats, um, consuming no less than one gram per kilogram per day of fat. We know that fat really needs to be a critical component of the diet, and having those, um, these components during meals helps create our fat stores to be used during exercise. We're really not going to take in a ton of fat during exercise. That's not recommended just because it takes so long to digest, but we want to have the fat stores present and make sure we have enough fat in our body for normal heart functioning, reproduction, um, and just normal body processes. So for that endurance athletes, again, total fat needs need to be greater than 70 grams per kilogram. Um, if we do 150 divided by 2.2 for kilograms, that would give us that. And then really, I normally calculate fat recommendations based off of the remaining calories after carbohydrates and protein needs are calculated. And then finally, we have our fruits and veggies. So how do these impact performance? So fruits and vegetables are a very rich source of our micronutrients and our vitamins and minerals, which really help support carbs, proteins, and fat do their job. They are like a light or like a match to light a fire. They're like a hammer. Um, to nail in a door on that structure, that energy that we use. Carbo um, fruits and veggies are also good sources of carbohydrates, especially fruits. Those are going to be more richer sources of um, carbohydrates. Some veggies will have more than others, but most of those have more water and fiber to be a real good fuel source of carbohydrates. Fruits and veggies are also very high in antioxidants and phytonutrients, which are very anti-inflammatory. Keeping in mind, intense exercise is a major stressor. As much as we might love being active and pushing our bodies and getting sweaty and working really hard, that is a big stress on the body. And the body has no idea that we love it. It just sees it as another stress. It is comparable to a bear attack. We get stress and that cumulative stress adds up. So athletes need to really take an extra caution against stress and making sure that they are taking in lots of anti-inflammatory foods, um, which neutralize stress in the body. So lots of different colorful, colorful fruits and vegetables. And then our fruits and veggies are also rich sources of fiber, which help support our gut health by, by producing prebiotic fiber, which help feeds our good gut probiotics, those gut bacteria that are crucial for gut health, for mental health, for performance. So really important to be eating fiber at meals, typically not close to exercise, again, because those normally, um, they take much longer time to digest, they help stabilize blood sugar, whereas we want that higher blood sugar during exercise um, to get into our muscle. And they typically can be a little bit more um, gas producing and bloating, which is not something we want to be feeling during exercise. And then some micronutrients of concern. I'm not going to go super deep into these just to be mindful of our time. Um, but calcium, iron, zinc, magnesium, B vitamins, and vitamin D are all um, really critical nutrients to be aware of for athletes. Um, and 
just to make sure you're getting a wide variety of the foods that we've talked about already to meet the needs of these. So next we're gonna talk about timing your fuel around workouts and training. So fuel timing goals really focus on pre-workout, during your workout, and post-workout. So pre-workout is all about making sure you have enough energy to get your exercise done and to make sure you can get through it with optimal performance. During a workout, you wanna maintain energy levels, and then post-workout is all about refueling and replenishing our muscle stores so we can start recovering and getting ready for the next um, bout of activity. So with fuel timing, it is really going to look at the closer we get to training, the simpler amount of the smaller and simpler amount of food we want to be taking in. So we're going to kind of move through this fuel timing picture, but you'll see here that we are really going to try and simplify things the closer we get to training. So there is less chance of GI upset. There's quicker food breakdown to get right into the muscles. So before training, three to four hours before, we can focus on our performance plate. So either that moderate training plate or a hard training plate. We wanna have a good source of carbohydrates, moderate in protein, and lower to moderate in fat and fiber here. Um, this is really individualized for the person to kind of know how much fiber you can take in before activity. Some people can't do any raw vegetables like the couple hours before they know they're gonna be working out because it's gassy, it might create a stomach ache. Um, other people do fine. So it really, that's kind of based on what your average intake is like and what you're used to. But most of the time I would not recommend, or I would recommend not having a massive salad, like three hours before you have a big game or a hard workout. Cause one that's displacing a lot of carbohydrates that you should be eating. And two, it's a ton of fiber that your body's going to take a while to break down and might be a little bit more gas producing, making sure you give yourself enough time to digest all of this food one to two hours before, we're gonna get a little bit less. Um, so this is gonna be mainly a carbohydrate rich snack with small amounts of protein and fat as tolerated. Um, and this small snack can happen if maybe you are, maybe you ate a meal three to four hours out, but then you're starting to feel hungry, or maybe you woke up in the morning and you have one to two hours before your workout. Um, these would be the snacks you wanna incorporate. So things like a peanut butter and jelly or peanut butter on waffles, a carb and protein base bar, um, a glass of milk with a banana, a bowl of oatmeal with um, an egg thrown in there. Simple options that aren't going to be super complex, but they're going to be enough to give you some energy. And then if we're at that 30 minute mark under an hour, this is when we want to and simple carbohydrates. So quick and easy to digest options that are going to top off energy stores that aren't going to cause a GI upset. It's going to be quick, easy sugar. So some fruit, dried fruit, um, applesauce, kind of things that are pre-digested a little bit, pretzels, animal crackers, fruit snacks, a sports drink, regular juice, all easy to digest food. So things to keep in mind with our pre-training fuel. Again, keep it simple. Choosing easy to digest carbohydrates and really limiting fat, fiber, and protein the closer you get to workouts. During um, making sure you practice your fueling, so this is a big one. Um, it's really important to train the gut to not only kind of take in food during exercise, which we'll talk about in a second, but make sure that your body is used to having carbohydrates before exercise and figuring out what works best for you, what gives you the most energy, what makes you feel your best, what's going to limit GI upset, making sure you have a snack on practice days, figuring out how this is going to work, and then not trying anything new on game days or events. Um, and then recognizing everybody is different. Some people are able to eat a full meal an hour before and other people can't even, they can drink like a glass of orange juice an hour before. It really depends. And this is where practicing and training with this and creating your own plan is super, super important. So during a workout, again, this is where we are focusing on maintaining our energy stores and replacing um, the energy and the glucose that might have already been depleted and used. So anything less than an hour, we really don't need to have anything. If you fueled well and you um, have good glycogen stores, if you ate a while in advance, you don't need to eat anything during. So really, we just want to focus on water, um, maybe introducing electrolytes, which we'll talk about. The only, if you are working to build up your gut tolerance and you're practicing, like, I want to try and see how this gel feels when I'm running 45 minutes today and see how it feels in my body, that could definitely be a time and 100% warranted to practice fueling and see how that feels less than an hour. 
anything more than an hour is when I start to recommend having carbohydrates during exercise. Um, some people can go like an hour and 15 minutes, but really once we're getting over that point, we're going to need to start replacing carbs because we don't want to wait until we're completely depleted and hit that wall and not be able to come back from it. So typically 30 to 60 grams per hour up to 90 grams per hour, depending on how long the activity is along with electrolytes. So these are going to be more of our um, sport engineered products, or you could eat quote unquote real foods. So I personally am a big fan of the sport engineered products. They're created for a reason. They have a good mix of um, different types of carbohydrates. So your body can maximize those the best way. So things like gels and chews. I personally love um, untapped maple syrup. It's phenomenal. There's a good um, ratio of glucose and fructose for our muscles to you for our um, energy stores to use. Um, Otherwise, sports drinks, and then you can have whole foods like dates or dried mango, applesauce, lots of different options there. And then um, for more than three hours, we're really looking towards that high end 90 grams of carbs per hour, making sure we're mixing up the fuel sources. This is going to be more for like a marathon, somebody who's running a long marathon. Um, but honestly, even then, I take that back. Even then, we're going to get to that high level of carbohydrates. But when you're running a marathon, you're pushing really hard. So you're focusing still only on carbohydrates up to that 90 grams per hour if you can tolerate it. When we start to take in more protein and fat during exercise, it might be during a ultra endurance event where the intensity level is much lower. It's not about working extremely hard. It's more about completing that event. So there's not as much blood that's being drawn to our muscles and away from the stomach. So we can digest food a little bit better. We have more time to get fuel to the body. We have more oxygen coming in. So that's something to keep in mind as well. And then recovery. So our main goals here are to refuel our muscles with carbohydrates, rebuild muscle with protein, and rehydrate with fluids and electrolytes. So after a workout, I personally recommend your workout is not done until you've had your post-workout snack. You are still kind of breaking down your body. You're still working hard until you eat something. So the sooner the better, in my opinion, to eat. Um, typically with our post-workout snack, you know, you're probably not going to feel super, super hungry if you just did a hard, intense exercise. And that's okay. Um, it's okay not to feel hungry. You still want to eat anyways. This is where we have more of a small snack, um, ideally with a three to one ratio of carbohydrates to protein. We'll talk about examples in a second. Um, if you're like ready to go, you finish your workout and you're like, I'm hungry, I'm ready to eat my meal, then go right into that meal. So if you had your post-workout snack, typically around like an hour to two after you wanna have your meal, otherwise go right into that meal. So this is where we're going back to that performance plate, having half our meal come from carbohydrates, um, a quarter from protein and getting in that fruits and veggies of color. Um, and then making sure we are increasing carbohydrates to refuel if we are um, having double sessions and having continuous carbohydrate intake throughout the day. So some good refueling snacks. My all time favorite is chocolate milk. Um, why this is is because chocolate milk has a good source of carbohydrates from lactose sugar. There is protein from milk um, from casein and whey protein in there. There is electrolytes, there's sodium, potassium, uh, magnesium, all in milk, as well as fluid to rehydrate. So there are lots of great options there. It tastes good, it's refreshing. Um, so I love having that just as an easy option. Other things you can do would be like a fruit smoothie. You could do a protein bar. Um, you could do a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You could do Greek yogurt with um, granola, some other simple options. So next, I'm gonna transition over and do hydration a little bit and then we'll cover supplements and then we'll be done. I know we're getting there. This is a lot of information, but I wanna make sure I give you guys as much as I can um, in this presentation. So with hydration, the real focus here is dehydration. And dehydration is a harmful reduction in the amount of water in the body greater than 2% of our body weight loss. And we lose water through breathing, through urine and through sweat. And sweating is something athletes and active individuals obviously do a lot more than the average person. So there are increased water and fluid needs and electrolyte needs for athletes. So dehydration will impact performance. Um, it can decrease your endurance. It can decrease strength and power. It will alter mood, um, alertness, concentration. Um, and I can't see my other box over here. And of course can lead 
sorry, oh, for muscle cramping. As I'm talking about hydration, I'm like, I need to drink some water. Um, 100% can also lead to muscle cramping. So, oops, here we go. So how do you figure out if you're dehydrated? So first thing um, that I like people to understand is that you can have a pretty good idea of your hydration based on your urine color. So ideally, I like to see a light pale yellow around like a lemonade color. That would be optimal hydration. If your pee is completely clear, that is a sign to me that you are overhydrating. So drinking too much water. Um, I'd recommend either cutting back a little bit, holding off on fluids for a little bit. This could also be not enough sodium in the diet. And so your water is not actually being absorbed into the cells and it's going right through. So athletes I often see sometimes not having enough sodium in the diet and then um, sometimes not drinking enough water, but not enough sodium um, typically because our society is told don't have salt, don't have sodium, limit your salt intake, whereas athletes um, specifically need to make sure you're having enough sodium. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, if your pee is a dark yellow color, that is a sign of dehydration and time to drink some more water there. So how do you calculate your fluid needs? So I recommend starting with taking your body weight and dividing in half, and that's the minimum amount of water you should be drinking a day. So if we have a 160 pound athlete, divide that in half is 80 ounces. And then you need to add more in for training and sweat losses. So 80 ounces would be the minimum. And then we need to factor in how much you're sweating and how to replace that. So during exercise, you are not only losing water, you are also losing electrolytes. So sweating is comprised of water and it's also comprised of magnesium, sodium, calcium, chloride, and potassium. So we have all those electrolytes and these all play really important roles in the body in terms of absorbing our nutrients as well, or absorbing water as well as muscle and cardiac function. Um, so really, really critical to make sure you're taking in electrolytes with hydration. So kind of my three H's for electrolytes are if it's really hot outside, if you are doing a, a workout that is extremely challenging and you're going to be working extremely hard, and if it's longer than an hour, or if you're at high altitude, if you are in any of these situations, then we need to be incorporating electrolytes into the fluids. So sports drinks are all designed to put back the electrolytes you lost from exercise. So Gatorade, Powerade, um, Body Armor, some of these are some popular sports drinks that you might see. They have carbohydrates, so they have simple carbs that are going to help replenish glycogen stores. And then they also, carbohydrates also do help support um, water. With every gram of carbohydrate, we also store an additional four grams of water in there. So carbs, water goes with carbohydrates. So that's really important. And then we also have sodium and potassium. Now, most people think with muscle cramping that um, you actually, that's coming from potassium. However, muscle cramping typically is due to a lack of sodium because that is the uh, mineral that we lose the most in sweat. During um, exercise, people can lose, typically the general is around a liter of sweat. If you are working extremely hard, it's going to vary a lot. And then um, sodium needs, sodium losses can be anywhere from 500 milligrams, anywhere from like 300 milligrams up to, again, 1,000 milligrams, depending on the person, up to 2,000. There can be a lot of salt loss depending on the person. And that's going to be really unique. Um, so it's hard for me to kind of tell you exactly. Typically, I recommend per hour anywhere from three to 500 milligrams of sodium um, added back to either your sports drink or from a salt tab if you don't like sports drinks or you're not having those. Um, but that's something to consider. So some hydration um, products that are out there. So we have the right stuff or um, element are your very high sodium concentrations. So those would be my really salty sweaters. And you would know if you're a salty sweater, if um, like after a tough workout, you notice a white residue um, on your face or on your clothing, that could be a sign of high sweat loss. Um, there is also the Gatorade patch that recently came out that can kind of show you, give you excuse me, give you an idea of sodium losses. Um, it measures your chloride and sodium and chloride go together. So um, that could be a potential option if you're looking to really track and see how much sodium to have. Otherwise, Noon, um, Scratch are my two favorites. Also, um, the Gatorade Endurance is a higher option and Drip Drop is an option. So these are all 
um, typically powders that you pour into water. Um, they give you flavor. They typically also have some carbohydrates in them as well. So these are all options to try. And then you can also make sure to incorporate electrolyte rich foods. So salty foods, make sure you are adding salt to your meals. Make sure you're having things like pickles, salted nuts, um, pretzels, goldfish, things that have higher sodium. Having lots of potassium, um, again, bananas, um, baked potatoes, citrus foods, calcium like dairy, um, so, um, calcium set tofu is an, op is an option for lactose intolerant people. Dark green leafy vegetables also have a good amount of calcium. Um, sardines are also very high in calcium because of the bones that are in the fish. Um, I don't know if that's an appealing option for many people, but I think that's a great um, option for high calcium content. And then magnesium are gonna be found a lot in nuts and seeds and dark green leafy vegetables. Some hydration tips. Um, and I didn't have a slide for this, but I also do wanna say, typically before exercise, I recommend having um, around 16 to 20 ounces of water, or like an hour to two out from exercise, and then sipping consistently to make sure you are well hydrated going into exercise. During exercise, I recommend every 20 minutes taking in two to three large gulps of water. And that's going to be around anywhere from three to eight ounces of water that you want to be having every 20, every 15 to 20 minutes. So having consistent water intake, not waiting until you're thirsty, making sure you're being proactive with hydrating. And then after exercise, you want to make sure that you're taking in water as well. Typically for every pound you lose of, ex of um, every pound you lose during exercise, we want to add in anywhere from around 20 to 24 ounces of fluid. So for people who are unsure, like, do I sweat a lot during exercise? I don't really know. I recommend taking your body weight before exercise and then after exercise and seeing how much weight you lose and then multiplying that by 20 to 24 ounces for your hydration. So some hydration tips, making sure you are having um, other beverages besides water. So milk, tea, seltzer, lemonade, smoothies, those can all be very hydrating. Use a straw. Um, a straw will really help to get water in you a little bit better. I know it sounds weird, but if you put a straw in things, you're more likely to drink them. Um, pick out a fun water bottle and keep it with you everywhere. Your water bottle should be always within like arm's reach. If it's in front of you, you will drink more of it. And then adding fruits and veggies that are high in water content. This is an easy way to just bump up water a bit. Okay. We're going to dive really quick into supplements and then we're going to wrap this up. Um, hopefully we can, we might go over with a little bit for questions um, and that's totally fine for me. So supplements are a combination of vitamins, minerals, and herbal um, supplements meant for performance or overall nutrition balance. So typically they have this ergogenic aid. How are they going to make your performance better is what most supplements are touted for. Do you need a supplement? So oftentimes I see a lot of people thinking, oh, well, I'll just have a supplement for this and that's gonna make me better. Let me, let me throw that back. I won't even question it. So you may be able to take a supplement, but should you? That is always the question that I ask. Yeah, you can take it, but should you? Do you really need it? I like to focus more on the foundation. So making sure we're choosing whole nutrient dense foods, making sure we're getting a wide variety of micronutrients. Then we can focus on the nutrient timing using sports fuel and then looking at supplements, really making sure that, that it's kind of the last thing in our foundation of an athlete. So some common supplement rich foods that I see a lot. So iron, omega-3s, collagen, vitamin D. These are some pretty popular ones. And I always encourage a food first approach unless there is like a severe, a severe severe, sorry, deficiency. Like if you are having um, low ferritin stores that are extremely low, you have iron deficiency anemia, or you have very low vitamin D levels where supplementation is necessary, then I would recommend a supplement. And that is based off lab work first, not just taking a supplement to supplement, but choosing nutrient rich foods that are going to give you these options. And you can see those in the photos here. So some common supplements are gonna be creatine, whey protein, collagen, vitamin D, um, omega-3s, iron, caffeine, juices. All of these are gonna have a time and the place. And when, I'm not gonna go into all of these because we just don't have enough time, but these are all common things. And when it comes to choosing a supplement, one, asking yourself if you really need it, can you get this from food first? Working with a healthcare provider, if it's a dietitian, if it's a sports dietitian, preferably like me or somebody else working with your doctor to make sure it's appropriate for your health condition. 
and then making sure that it's third party tested. So you want to make sure when you're looking for a supplement that there is a company that goes and makes sure that what is in the product is really there. Supplements are not regulated by the FDA, so companies can honestly put in whatever they want. They can lie on the labels. And for athletes specifically, there are banned substances, and they can get um, kicked out of their events if they are taking these banned substances, like too much caffeine, um, other sort of things that we're not going to cover right now, but there are things. So I recommend for active individuals and athletes um, to look for these two certifications. So these will be labels on a supplement. The National Sanitation Foundation has a certified for sport label and informed choice is another option. And these basically these companies go in and test products, make sure that there are no banned substances, make sure that what is on the label is accurate. Okay. so to wrap things up, these are our foundations as an athlete. So really remembering to meet energy needs, have consistent protein intake, make sure carbohydrates are your best friend and you are having enough of them, Um, making sure you're having lots of fruits and vegetables to promote recovery, building that strong plate, managing fluid and electrolytes. And then these last two things are also critical. So making sure you are getting good sleep. As a dietitian, I still think that sleep is the most important thing you can do for your performance. That is when your body is getting all of its um, deep, deep restorative healing time um, when you're getting a good quality sleep. So ideally, seven to nine hours. I typically recommend for athletes more like eight to 10 hours of sleep per night and then making sure you're controlling stress in other ways. So like we said, exercise is a stressor. Make sure you're taking adequate time for recovery and having um, positive kind of stress reducing activities. And then my final thing, I could have sent out an entire presentation on this, but I always like to have just at least one quick word on making sure that everybody understands that athletes come in all shapes and sizes. There is no one certain look to an athlete and there is no one specific body type for an athlete. You can be fat and be an athlete. You can live in a larger body and be extremely active. All runners are runners. You don't have to look a certain way. So really, like I said, I really, really work to help people understand that you can work hard to optimize performance through nutrition while also having a healthy relationship with food in your body. So making sure that your goals for nutrition should be to be making your performance great, not to lose weight, not to be trying to look a certain way, but how to get the best out of what you can do. So That is all I have. Um, Again, if anybody would like to meet, I am a free resource for any staff, um, faculty, students of SNU that live in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, where I'm licensed. Um, You can contact me via email, which you'll see here, or um, you can follow me on Instagram where I am moderately active. I used to be more, but time has escaped. And I try and put stuff on there, but you can always feel free to follow me there too. And that's all I have. I know I went a little bit over. Um, If anybody has questions or thoughts, um, Alicia, you can moderate for me. Otherwise, yeah. I will stop the recording right now, just so everyone is aware.